there, fellow Sojourners, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture. Happy New Year to you. On today's episode, we're resolving to get back to the basics by reinforcing the premise of this teaching series, which is emphasizing the importance of Christian engagement with the arts as a means of cultivating the cultural soil to make it more receptive to the gospel. In particular, we're going to be looking at story formulas or story principles, including why such things exist, why we resonate with such things, and what it ultimately means. I'm Pastor Shane, and I'll be your story consultant today as we appropriate some culture. I love fiction books. Do you? No, I don't. They're not real. I like things that are real. Oh, well, I like fiction books because I think it takes you to a different world, uh -huh. you know, and um, sure. people create a story and characters that you fall in love with. Yeah, Maybe. but they're not real. I mean, you know that, right? I remember in high school, they made us read The Great Gatsby. I asked my teacher, did this happen? And he was like, no. And I was like, well, why they write it down? Uh, that's a clip from They Came Together, which, as you can probably guess, is a parody of romantic comedies. But the mockery here is, in some way, getting at something that isn't totally absurd and completely ridiculous, which is, why is it that human beings write down things that didn't actually happen? Why is it that we all like fiction books and fiction movies to boot? Uh, why do we, as a universal condition of humanity, resonate with story? Why are we a storytelling species that says something about us, doesn't it? And over the many, many centuries of telling each other stories, we discovered what works and what doesn't work, what's effective and what's ineffective in telling a story. And from that, patterns start to emerge and structures take form. This dates all the way back to Aristotle's Poetics, which is really the earliest work on dramatic theory that we have. And in modern times, there's all kinds of books on the subject. The Hero's Journey by Joseph Campbell, Story by Robert McKee, Save the Cat by Blake Schneider, and on and and on it goes. And these works are looking at patterns, and from those patterns they produce principles for storytelling. If you've read enough or watched enough, you're already aware of these basic patterns. If I were to pause a movie halfway through and I were to ask you, what's going to happen in the end? Broad strokes, you'd probably guess right. Uh, you may not know the details, you may not know how it's going to happen, but you still recognize the broader patterns at play. The how and the details is actually the reason why we watch. Case in point, if you're watching a romantic comedy, you already know the ending. The guy and the girl are going to get together. We know the pattern, we just want to see how. Now, the more formulaic the material, the more genre basic it is, the easier it becomes to see the patterns. But all successful narratives adhere to a basic story structure. Really basic things like a, a protagonist, right? Stories have a protagonist, a hero, a main character, the person or people that the story is about. Stories also then have an antagonist, right? Those that are in opposition to the protagonist. Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader, John McClane, Hans Gruber, Josh Allen, Tom Brady. And because there's antagonists to the protagonist, stories have conflict. The conflict usually being defined by the kind of antagonist. You might remember from English class the different kinds of conflict. Man versus man. Man versus nature. Man versus self. Man versus woman. Woman versus parallel parking. I might have made some of those up. And because stories are about conflict, stories have resolutions to those conflicts. It comes to a head at a climax, right? basic English class. Uh, we see these patterns, and from them we derive principles of story structure that apply to all genres and all stories because they work. But why do they work? You know, you also see patterns in other art as well. Uh, music, for instance, you'll see common chord progressions, uh, major and minor keys elicit different emotions from us. And that could be explained as just Homo sapiens respond to certain stimuli. Right? The human ear just likes the sound of certain chord progressions. Minor keys just strike us for some reason as being more melancholy. You could attempt to boil that down to just a physical response to physical stimuli. Right? Here's a sound. 
Human beings respond a certain way to that sound. It's merely physical. I'm not sure it is, but when it comes to the principles of story, we're not responding to a sound. We're not responding to any of the five senses. We're not responding to physical stimuli. We're responding to an idea. It's immaterial. It doesn't have physical properties. We're resonating and connecting with an immaterial reality, following the same pattern, telling the same stories in different ways over and over again because it means something to us, even if we can't say what it means. C.S. Lewis wrote a letter uh, describing a discussion that he had with his friends Tolkien and Dyson. This was a monumental moment for him in his walk toward Christianity. He says this, Now what Dyson and Tolkien showed me was this, that if I met the idea of sacrifice in a pagan story, I didn't mind it at all. Again, that if I met the idea of a god sacrificing himself to himself, I liked it very much and was mysteriously moved by it. Again, that the idea of the dying and reviving god, Baldur, Adonis, Bacchus, similarly moved me, provided I met it anywhere except in the Gospels. The reason was that in pagan stories I was prepared to feel the myth as profound and suggestive of meanings beyond my grasp, even though I could not say in cold prose what it meant. Now, the story of Christ is simply a true myth, a myth working on us in the same way as the others, but with this tremendous difference, that it really happened. I like the dying and rising God as a myth, as a story, but I don't like it as truth or as reality. I heard screenwriter and atheist Craig Mazin say that the reason Christianity took off the way it did was because it's such a great story. But I think, like early Lewis, that's getting it the other way round. That's like saying we like looking at things so we have eyes. No, we have eyes so we like looking at things. One predates the other. If Christianity strikes us as a great story, that's only because there's something in us that already yearns for that story that resonates with that immaterial reality. The reason those myths spoke to C.S. Lewis is because they were pointing him to the true myth. The Bible declares in Ecclesiastes, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Patterns emerge. Story structure takes shape because there's a universal human pull toward them. Eternity set in our hearts. So over the next couple of weeks, I want to take a look at some of these story principles, these storytelling structures, and see what they mean and what they say about the nature of humanity and the triune God. And we'll start today with something very basic, which is meaning. <laughs> Stories are designed things. Stories have storytellers. Stories are the product of a mind. Every single scene in a movie has a purpose and function in service to the story. It's not a random assortment of scenes. It's not a series of chaotic, disconnected sequences or events. You can't just flip to random pages in a book, like, like, well, like this book, for instance. You can't just, you know, read whatever. Because scenes build upon one another, leading from one to another, intricately woven to produce a story, a narrative, a continuous thread with a beginning, middle, and end. See, stories are natural conduits of meaning, which is why human beings have a need for story. It's not just entertainment. You know, TikTok videos can be entertaining. A sketch comedy can be entertaining. You could spend hours watching random, unconnected, bite-sized videos pop up in a feed and be entertained. But they don't mean anything. And they don't add up to anything. The commercials between the TV dramas is not the same thing. A story is different. A narrative is a series of connected events, a series of connected scenes, a series of connected sequences that contain purpose and therefore meaning. We would be completely unsatisfied and deeply angered if we were watching a movie or reading a novel that was completely random in construction. Human beings have a need for meaning. Is life a series of random, unconnected events? Is human life unintended and purposeless? Is the universe itself utterly meaningless? Story says no. Story is not random or disconnected events. Story is intended and purposeful. Story is filled with meaning. Why do we gravitate to stories? Why are we storytelling creatures? Why do we write things down that didn't really happen? There's something in us. There's something in us. Did a purposeless world in a meaningless universe produce a species that evolved by chance to desire story, 
to yearn for meaning, to yearn for something that doesn't exist? Or is our storytelling pointing us to something else, to a deeper truth, to eternity set in our hearts, to order, to purpose, to meaning, to a grand narrative? Well, we'll talk more about story structure in the coming weeks. In the meantime, January is going to be a giveaway month. If you subscribe this week to our YouTube channel, or even better, if you join my author's Facebook page, Nathan J. Miller, you will be eligible to receive a free and signed copy of my latest book, The Witch, the Gargoyle, and the Perfectly Perfect Man. Wow! Uh, so don't wait. Join the movement to tangibly appropriate the culture, and I'll see you next week for more ATC. Music